you only have to go back 30 years and it's pre-dairy here. The land wasn't empty, the land was busy being used for all sorts of things that were way less harmful, and that's what we have to do. We have to, we have to realise we made a big mistake here and, and let's sort it out. And it's not just me saying this, I mean, many, many people have said this is not the place for, for dairy. It's just, it's too porous. It, everything comes out of there too, too easily. So for the Canterbury situation, what we've got is the mountains, the Southern Alps here, and basically just huge outwash plains of gravel that come out. So the mountains being pushed up and being eroded down and the gravel's being pushed out by the rivers across the plains here. So everything that happens on all of that flat land out there, the groundwater is very connected to the surface water, the river water, it's like a big gravel fan with water flowing through it from the mountains, from the glaciers. So for the Canterbury situation, where you have dairy farming happening on these gravelly soil, it couldn't happen without irrigation. And so a huge amount of water, more irrigation in Canterbury than the whole rest of New Zealand put together to make this landscape into a dairy farming situation. calculated how much waste comes from one cow and the limit is one cow per hectare. The average for Canterbury is up over three and a half cows per hectare. You know, this is extremely intensive farming here. You know, it seems natural to have animals on the land and it would be, but the intensity of them, the number of cows per area of land is so much higher because these external inputs, this synthetic nitrogen fertilizer made from fossil fuels, palm kernel coming from the other side of the world, cranking up the number of cows per area. goes onto the land to grow the grass, the cows eat the grass, they take in the nitrogen but it doesn't go out with the milk. Uh, only a tiny proportion of that nitrogen goes out as milk. The rest of it goes out through their urine. It's basically almost pure nitrogen coming out through their urine and, and, and if you've seen a cow urinate you know that it's just this dump of, of you know, litres of, of liquid onto the land. such high intensities of nitrate and so much volume of liquid that it just goes straight down and it goes very quickly past the root zones through those gravelly soils and into the layers and layers of aquifers that run out this way. And then those aquifers pop up in the rivers and the rivers downflow into them, but they basically make their way out to here. The first name for Waihora was Te Keti Iko or Rakai Hotu, so the fish basket of Rakai Hotu. And there's 165 different varieties of birds and probably 45 different kinds of fish that are in Te Waihora. It's a significant food basket and it has been for generations. Everything seeps into Waihora, so Waihora is like the sink at the end of the drain and so whatever we do upstream is going to have an impact on what eventually arrives in Waihora. What happens in, in aquatic systems and fresh water is that nitrogen drives algal growth, which is the water version of grass basically. And that's when you see the lake change into all these odd colours. You can have cyanobacteria, which is lethal to life. It can kill the bird life, it can kill the fish life, it can kill humans. Um, and plus, it, it alters the oxygen 
concentration. All around the world there are dead zones that are caused by nutrients flowing out into the ocean because of the, there's no oxygen in the water. And this is the same kind of thing that happens in the lakes and rivers here. Oh, I've been here about 30 years. What's the difference? What, what do you used to see? Well, you'd catch your limit every day. Like 30 flounders a day, now you get lucky to get one. Each month, I take surface water samples from the Rakaia huts to the Halsall River. It's measuring milligrams per litre nitrate N. It should be well less than one milligram for a lake. And, and so that's, that's three or four times higher than the national bottom line. This is the problem. Nitrogen, you can't see it. I've always felt that if nitrogen turned our rivers and lakes red, there's no way we would have got to this point. The other part of that, of course, is that in, in Canterbury, all of our drinking water is coming from the groundwater. And so it's not just an issue for the lake and for the ecosystem, but it's also a human issue now as well. I'm Ian Piper. I live out in the Dunsandal region of Canterbury Plains. I live here with my two young boys and my wife Amy. <laughs> this is the well here that we started with back in 2010 when we first moved into the property. The uh, test results that uh, we first got back in 2015 were around about the 13 odd. Last year we got our water tested again uh, and the test results uh, had shot up quite a lot. They had gone into the mid-17s. At that point we decided to bite the bullet, uh, go to our bank and get a mortgage so we could get a new well. We did that, we got the water tested uh, and the new well was around about 11. So we were only marginally below the New Zealand standard. To me, I still wasn't happy with this. We're now drinking water through our voice osmosis machine. That's got our levels down to about 4.2. All up now, we would have spent close to $17,000 withdrawing the well and putting the filters in place. And still no cigar. Still no cigar, still no clean water. I don't think we need to go any further into the future to know that where we've been has been a mistake. I think we can look at the science today and say this has been wholesale regulatory failure. Over the last 30 years, Environment Canterbury has been monitoring different groundwater areas across Canterbury. And we know that 73% of them are either likely or very likely still increasing in nitrates. So it's a dire, it's, it's a serious situation. It's not the farmer's fault that they, that they have these problems of, of the intensity of farming in Canterbury. They've just merely responded to the market drivers and they're just doing what they can to, to stay in business. I'm John Sunkel. I'm a 61-year-old dairy farmer from Leeston. I've been involved in water management within this catchment for approximately 15 years and have been an environment Canterbury councillor for six. Again, it's a hell of a mess, isn't it? I mean, whatever, for whatever reason, We've got a big problem. We do. Uh, Environment Canterbury has been in place for 30 odd years and we have recognised those challenges. We have planning processes in place. We have worked catchment by catchment to put interventions in place, recognising those challenges and requiring dairy farmers and all farming systems to reduce their nutrient loss footprints. Within the Selwyn, a 30% reduction in nitrates. Within Ashburton Council, County area, 35% reductions. But those th actions will take time to come to pass to give effect to. So when you hear 30 to 35 percent reductions and, and you know that sounds like really reasonable right what you need to be aware of is that we're actually talking about reductions from a set baseline period so whatever you were polluting between 2009 to 2013 is your baselines. All that really means is if you were polluting a hundred times what you should be if you meet the reductions, then you're polluting 
you know, 70 times more than you should be, for example. You could argue too many cows on the plains. I could argue that we haven't done enough to mitigate the effects of those, those cows on the plains. If we went and looked at uh, CRISPR technology, using some GE technology, used some, some grasses and forages to reduce the, the losses of nitrate nitrogen to the receiving environment, why cannot we have our cake and eat it as well? All that tells me is that we are polluting a little bit less. It doesn't tell me that we're actually moving the dial in terms of the magnitude of change required to actually have a functional environment. We're talking about functional ecosystems, safe drinking water, and rivers and streams and lakes that ideally we can swim in. Too late, the council is, is putting pressure on farmers to reduce the amount of nitrogen that's lost from their systems, and a lot of it is misdirected. This is Birdlings Brook on Tim Chamberlain's property. This is definitely riparian planting and it's providing a buffer between the farmed land and the stream. Well, the buffer will be very effective at filtering out sediment and faecal organisms. Um, it won't be as effective against uh, nitrate from further up the plains. Planting up riverbanks is great for a whole lot of reasons, but it's not addressing the key issue, which is that nitrogen moving down through the soils. It doesn't matter what you do on the edge of that, it's the, the pressure going down. We're not getting there with what we're doing at the moment because we're, we're talking about a few percent change or up to 20% change is seen as extreme when our calculations show that we need a 12 to 20 fold reduction in the number of cows to achieve healthy fresh water. What does 12-fold mean? I'm, I'm not a bloody scientist who works through the numbers, but I don't believe that a 12-fold reduction allows us to farm in these communities in any sort of way if, if that's the requirement to achieve an outcome. Some would say then, John, that you're seeing your business as more important than our environment. Maybe I am, but I'm asking you if you want me to make that significant change, um, what are you asking me to change to? What, would, what, what will you give up? Would you give up your house, your car, your retirement fund, your super fund, everything that you own and, and have strived to for your retirement and, and walk away from that? I don't want to diminish the real societal impacts on particularly rural and farming communities that a, a serious change to prioritising the environment first will have. The change has to be enabled. We have to be able to help farmers get out of the trap that they're in at the moment. And we've got an example of how to do it in the Lake Taupo and the Lake Rotorua catchments. Farmers have been paid $120 million to stop dairy farming to save those two lakes. I would love to see central government actually seizing the power that they hold to shift this dial much further and faster. If the government or the people in New Zealand believe that that is what they want, then pay me, pay me out, I'll walk away. But in the interim, um, don't just tell me I need to cut cows or do something or do something different when I have no pathway. Until you start getting rid of these girls off the land at the intensity they are, you're not going to see a change. Why would you expect it to change if you carry on doing the same thing? Whereas at the moment, it just keeps building up year after year after year, a debt for future generations. Whereas we need to bite the bullet now and stop it from happening. Because it is about our kids and our grandkids and future generations. The simple you know, fact is we either pay now or they pay later.